Hi, everybody. Let's talk about hydrangeas. It's a beautiful shrub, and there's lots of new cultivars coming out now. But growing hydrangeas can be a little bit confusing. Some bloom on new wood, some bloom on old wood. Some can have blue flowers, and some can't. Some can tolerate shade better than others. So here to demystify hydrangeas and show us some of the best cultivars and how to take care of them is Esther McGinnis, an extension horticulturist from NDSU. Esther, welcome to the forums. Thank you, Tom. Now, when Tom asked me to give this talk, I have to admit, I was a little reticent. Uh, I really was because, you know, we have Todd West that does actual research trials on hydrangeas, and I usually focus more on uh, perennials, so um, herbaceous perennials. But then I started to think, you know, what can I offer our viewing audience? And then I realized I had a personal story and a personal journey uh, concerning hydrangeas that I could share with our audience. And I realized that, like a lot of our gardeners, I had fallen for the allure of a blue hydrangea. Um, now, now what I can offer our listeners is group therapy because I can imagine there are a lot of you that have fallen for blue hydrangeas and have been sorely disappointed. So we should all form a group therapy group and we can share share our stories and such. But my story started with um, uh, Nico Blue. And this was when I was in my late 20s. My husband and I had, I had constructed a new home, and we had a blank slate that we could landscape. So I didn't know anything about horticulture at the time, so I drove to our, our closest big box store and loaded up my trunk with all sorts of shrubs and stuff. And in the store, I fell in love with this beautiful blue hydrangea. You know, it was blooming like crazy. It had that lovely blue that was like a robin's egg. And I knew I had to have that plant, and I was going to put it in a place of prominence. It was going to go in my front garden, right by the front door, and everybody would have to walk by this beautiful Nico blue hydrangea. Now, the first year, it did really well, and then we had winter, and I was dreaming about blue flowers for summer. But what happened? You know, the snow melted, and I realized that my new blue hydrangea had winter damage. I could see that the stems had died back and such. So I did trim off the dead ends, and I thought, well, maybe it can bounce back. Well, no flowers that first summer. I was like, well, it's just getting established. I'll wait till next year. Nothing. Year three, absolutely no flowers whatsoever. So at that point in time, I learned a new concept, plant hardiness zones. And I learned Nico Blue was hardy to zone five. So a tough lesson to learn as a young homeowner that I had bought something that was not hardy uh, to my zone. So I, I, I got a little bit, a little bit more creative, started doing more research and, st and such. And then I learned about Endless Summer. So Endless Summer was released in 2003, 2004, somewhere in that time frame. And it was sold as really the holy grail for Minnesota and the North Country that we could actually plant a hydrangea that would produce blue flowers and it would be hardy and it would be glorious. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of you bought into this. So I planted it. I followed the instructions from the nursery. You know, they told me to acidify the soil. Can't remember if I used aluminum sulfate or sulfur. I did that. I added peat to the bottom of my planting hole. And then I waited. So that first year, I did have blue flowers. The next year came, and I noticed the flowers were no longer blue. They were kind of a nice shade of purple. And I was like, well, I do like purple. It's one of my favorite colors. I can live with purple. But the following year, um, um, the following year, it was pink. But I've, I've learned a lot about hydrangea. And this, this wonderful uh, endless summer um, had a unique story. So the unique story with Endless Summer is that it really was a Nico Blue. And the Nico Blue had a mutation in a gardener's a landscape. 
Now, it so happened this gardener lived in the Twin Cities, and he lived next door to a plant breeder or somebody that worked at a nursery. So this, this neighbor was astute and noticed that this Nico Blue uh, performed beyond expectations. Uh, so he noticed that um, with, with this one, it, it didn't just survive, it thrived and produced these beautiful flowers. Um, so that, that became Endless Summer. And what was so special about Endless Summer is that it flowered on both new wood and old wood. But let's define those terms. Let's just slow it down here for a second. So with, um, with old wood, the flower buds are induced and initiated by, um, by environmental conditions, you know, changing photo period, changing temperatures in late summer. And then those flower buds stayed on the stem all winter, and then they bloom the following year. But I bet you our, our readers can imagine that things can go wrong with old wood. Um, as you can imagine, those flower buds are um, exposed to winter temperatures, and um, they're also exposed to late frosts in April and early May. So the problem with our, the old Nico Blue is that it flowered on old wood and then was not able to survive, you know, all those late spring frosts. Now we have shrubs that have that flower on new wood. Now with new wood, the flower buds are initiated the year that it actually blooms, and it blooms on the newer growth, the newer twigs. Now that's, um, now that has some advantages because it's not going to be exposed to winter temperatures. So endless summer, um, Endless Summer was sold as blooming on both new and old wood. So we all assumed that this was going to be a great product. But as I mentioned, I planted it in my garden. Year one, it was blue. The second year, it was purple. And by the third year, I had pink blooms. So what was going on there? It has to do with soil pH. Now, when we have a more acidic soil, um, these hydrangeas will flower blue. Now, if, if you have a more alkaline soil, it will flower pink. So what happened with my plant? I did try and acidify the soil, but I ran a soil test um, where I lived and found out that my soil pH was closer to 8.0, a real alkaline soil you know, on the south side of the Twin Cities. In fact, it's really not that much different than my soil here in Fargo. But I could not maintain that blue color no matter how much uh, soil acidifier I had put in, no matter what fertilizer I used, I could not keep it because the soil resisted the changes it was able to buffer that. And then in addition, with my endless summer, I found that I didn't have a whole lot of blooms. Instead of having a whole season's worth of blooms, I didn't have any blooms on the old wood because the buds were frozen off. And then it did bloom on new wood, but it was more towards the end of the season. You know, I'd get two or three blooms and then fall would come. So I, I experienced a lot of disappointment. Now, since then, I've learned a lot about hydrangeas and we have um, typically three different species that we grow. So hydrangea macrophylla or big leaf hydrangea, this is the species that endless summer is in. You know, as I mentioned, you get you know, somewhere on, on the, the scale between pink and blue as far as flowers. You can have different flower heads. The mop head is more globe shaped. The lace cap is more flat. Um, and the coloration depends on the soil pH. Now, most of our big leaf hydrangeas are hardy to zone five or higher, not, not the zones we have in North Dakota. Now, of all the big leaf hydrangeas, the Endless Summer series is the hardiest of the bunch, and the plant will thrive. And I found that it was, it was quite beautiful as far as its foliage. However, just because a plant is hardy doesn't mean that you're going to have prolific blooms. So I, I really didn't have liable flowering on my plant, but I also learned that as I did more research on it, People that live in more southern states, we're talking Illinois, you know, Iowa, Ohio, they have the same complaints. So how can we be expected to have great success um, with endless summer in the North Country if they're having problems in Chicago?
Now, of course, there are going to be a few individuals that are going to say, oh, my endless summer has done wonderfully here in North Dakota. But it's most likely uh, a shrub that has been planted in a very protected microclimate. Um, and, and the homeowner may have taken great care to mulch the plant to try and preserve some of the old wood and those, those buds on it. You know, in addition, they tried to give it um, the right conditions, which would have been part shade and moist soils. Now, I've learned a lot. Um, now, before I went back for my horticulture degree, uh, I, I started learning about Annabelle hydrangea. Now, Annabelle hydrangea is, is absolutely beautiful. You'll see we've got the white blooms on the right-hand side of this picture. And it's in a different species. It's in hydrangea arborescence, otherwise known as smooth hydrangea. Now, what's typical for this species is that you will see a globe-shaped flower head. So think a nice rounded dome. And fortunately, the species as a whole is a whole lot hardier. Now, it tends to get larger than our endless summers um, because it is hardy. It'll grow to be about three to four feet tall and wide. It will also bloom earlier in the season, starting in June. Now, the oldest cultivar in this species is Annabelle, released around 1910, and it's named after Anna, Illinois. Now, it, it's, a, it's a solid plant. I had it, absolutely loved it, but it did have a couple of flaws. Um, the flower heads are quite large, and they tend to weigh down the stems, so you'll notice that it has a tendency for the stems to lodge. Um, in addition, you'll notice that the plant will sucker and, and go beyond the three to four feet in width. So I found that with Annabelle hydrangeas, I had to stake them, and then in the spring, I also had to cut off the suckers to try and maintain a more compact size. Now, fortunately, we have newer cultivars on the market. Um, Incredible is one of them, and this has gotten a lot of publicity. It was bred to have sturdier stems, but they found that in the process of breeding the shrub to have sturdier stems, um, the flower heads actually got bigger. Um, so the claim to fame is that Incredible is not supposed to flop. Uh, however, in talking with Todd West, he's not totally happy with the sturdiness of the stems, but it is still far better than Annabelle as far as that. Um, there's another um, introduction in the Incredible series called Incredible Blush, and you'll notice that it's this nice light pink. But once again, look at the size of that, that inflorescence or flower head. Um, it's really almost like a basketball as far as the size. Now, we don't have data on this, um, but Incredible Blush is supposed to have slightly sturdier stems. So I would be more inclined to purchase an Incredible Blush than Incredible, you know, based on stem sturdiness. Now, others that are um, within the same species, we're seeing a lot of Invincibles on the market. Uh, Invincible Spirit 1, uh, that was kind of a mediocre Invincible Spirit 2 seems to be better. Um, you'll notice that you know the buds come out, it's red, then they open to pink, and eventually the, the plant will transition to, to green in the fall. Um, and there's Invincible Ruby. So Invincible is the newest one. Um, it, you'll have a two-toned flower with ruby red and then kind of a silvery pink to it. Now, I've yet to see my first Invincible Ruby. This is one of the newer ones. I think there are a couple more Invincibles that are hitting the market now. So these are some of the newest cultivars, and we're still kind of learning about them and how they do in our landscape. Now, keep in mind, now with any of these smooth hydrangeas, none of them can be blue. So the best we can do is pink or, or red. Now, our third species. Um, hydrangea paniculata or panicle hydrangea and you'll you can easily identify these so look at the flowers and um, the flowers will be cone shaped or pyramidal so you'll see a distinct point on them so that's the easiest way to tell a panicle hydrangea remember the smooth hydrangea was more dome shaped uh, panicle hydrangea is largely hardy to North Dakota it does bloom later than our smooth hydrangeas, um, and it really depends on the cultivar. Um, 
uh, we'll talk about different cultivars and their bloom times as we proceed. Now the oldest cultivar um, is PG hydrangea, and I'm sure our listeners have heard of PG hydrangea. Um, now this was is, is quite a large plant. We're talking a height of eight feet tall by 10 feet wide. So a very large specimen plant, probably not suitable as a foundation planting. Now like um, Annabelle, the older cultivar did have a tendency to flop because it produced those large flower heads. Now with panicle hydrangea, they're known for changing colors. You know, they start off white and then they turn, in this case, um, with PG hydrangea, turns salmon colored in the fall. So you do have kind of a nice fall coloration. And then we'll talk about pruning here in, in a couple minutes. This is hydrangea paniculata, but once again, you can see the flower heads coming to a point. Um, so I believe this one is a PG um, cultivar. And we're going to talk about newer cultivars that are on the market. We're going to talk about three series. In each of these series, it's kind of interesting where you've got a really tall shrub, or if you want, you can choose a more compact related shrub. The first one is Quick Fire. Um, and as its name suggests, it's an early bloomer. So it's the first of the, the major panicle hydrangeas to bloom. They'll start to bloom. Um, you know, in mid to late June here in North Dakota. Now, all the panicle hydrangeas take more sun than, um, uh, than our big leaf hydrangea. So you'll notice on the tag they say full to part sun. And we'll talk, we'll explain that just a little bit more. It does impact the color of the petals. Now, with quick fire, it starts off white, and then you see it has kind of this little, you know, these little, um, individual flowers here that are clustered together, but not as densely as some of the other cultivars. And then the flowers turn deep pink. Uh, and then towards fall, they're gonna start to turn brown. Now you can elongate the time that the individual petals stay pink by planting it in part sun as opposed to full sun. So we're finding that part sun is a little bit more advantageous. Um, so you want to make sure it has enough sun to photosynthesize and produce flowers, but not so much that it dries out the petals. So quick fire is going to be six to eight feet tall, four to six feet wide. Now for its uh, smaller sibling, little quick fire. So this is more suitable for a foundation planting, three to five feet tall, three to five feet wide and it does bloom at around the same time as, as its larger counterpart. Vanilla strawberry. Now, I think this is probably the most popular of our panicle hydrangeas, at least, at least from what I can tell in our nurseries. Um, now this one is zone three hardy, um, and this is the taller version, six to seven feet tall, but a little bit narrower. This will bloom at a little bit later than our quick fire series, so more, more in July. Um, now the flowers are really interesting. Um, they do start off white, transition to pink, and then to uh, a strawberry red. But it will continue to initiate flowers throughout the rest of the growing season. So you will see quite a bit of variety on the same plant. You'll see some flowers that are white, some that are pink, some that are red, um, which really is kind of a nice characteristic. Uh, however, the stems um, do flop a bit. So that's one drawback, but some people like it. It does give it a little bit of a weeping look to it. But here you can see the variation you know, from, from white to, um, to that nice strawberry red. And the pollinators seem to enjoy it too. Its smaller counterpart is Strawberry Sunday. It has a lot of the same attributes to it, um, but smaller in stature. And then for our final series, our final series is Lime. Um, so we have Limelight is the larger of the two. This is a little bit more unique. The flowers start off lime colored and then transition to pink and then burgundy as the season progresses. Now of the three series, this will bloom the latest. Um, now this will, you know, kind of the same type of effect as far as where to plant. You know, this uh, panicles do take a little bit more sun than, than others, um, but this is the taller of the two in the lime series. 
Now, fortunately, limelight is known for having stronger stems, so it's not going to droop in the same way that strawberry sundae or vanilla strawberry does. Now, here's a nice plant of it showing its coloration. And then little lime is going to be the more compact version. Now, I wanted to say a word on pruning, you know, before I take questions. Pruning is really going to depend on you knowing the species and what kind of hydrangea you have. It's a little bit different for, for each of them. Now, first, you've got your smooth hydrangeas. Now, with the older cultivar Annabelle, this blooms on new wood, and now you understand what it means to bloom on new wood. Um, now, with Annabelle, you know, I have quite a bit of personal experience with this. You just want to chop it to the ground in late March or early April. Um, the, the alternative is that you can do this in the fall. Um, now, I've tried to leave it up over the winter, but I found that kind of the flower head does kind of blow away in winter, so it doesn't have a whole lot of winter interest. Um, so you can pick your time to do it, but it will bloom more uniformly and have larger flowers if you cut, cut it off to the ground. Now, the newer cultivars that are smooth hydrangeas have different advice. They tell you to cut them back by one-third in the spring, cut them back to a live bud, um, they will supposedly have stronger stems if you don't cut the newer cultivars all the way to the ground. So just cut them back by a third. You want to have a little bit older stem. The stem will lignify or become a little bit more wooden and will give strength to the stem. So treat the old cultivars differently than the new. Then there's hydrangea macrophylla, as I mentioned, which has hardiness issues. You'll find that this is never going to get to the point where you really need to severely prune it because it's gotten too big. You're not going to have that problem. You're going to find that winter takes care of it for you. So all you need to do is remove uh, the dead stems. Um, and then if you have stems that are surviving, you cut it back to a live bud. So not a whole lot that you need to do there. Hydrangea paniculata. Um, this blooms on new wood. Now don't don't prune the whole thing to the ground. Um, we do have a couple of strategies that are suggested for a paniculata. Um, now, for a larger plant, you know, you take off any of the dead branches and then you cut off the spent flowers and a little bit of the stem. You know, maybe a quarter, a quarter of the stem in early spring. Of course, going back to that live bud, um, we'll find that that will spur, um, that will spur. Uh, development from a sturdier part of the stem and that contributes to having a, a little bit more more strength to hold up the flower. Now over time you may find that you need to rejuvenate your panicle hydrangea. I mean you know this is the case if you have too many stems and you're finding that your flower heads are getting a little bit smaller. So in that case, maybe remove a quarter or a third of the bra oldest branches each year, and that's going to cause the plant to redirect more energy to the remaining branches and into those flowers. So very much a different strategy as far as pruning. All right, so I think I'm, I'm going to try and get us out of here on time. Now, we do have some photo sources here, um, but I wanted to leave time for questions. Okay, here we go. Let everybody please uh, give us your questions. Um, do these newer cultivars of a hydrangea require as much water as the older varieties? Now, the question I think depends on the species. Each one is a little bit different. I think the macrophyllas required more. Um, uh, required more watering than the PG, or I should say the paniculata or the smooth hydrangeas. Now be careful, don't overwater these. You can overwater them, and particularly if you're on a clay soil. We find that our hydrangeas don't want to be sitting in water. You can kill them, and you'll know it because you'll notice that your leaves will in fact start to brown, and then you'll lose, you'll be losing leaves. So I've actually seen the other end of the spectrum where we overwater. But are you familiar with pink diamond? It's a hardy uh, paniculata type. I am familiar with pink diamond, and it does quite well here in Fargo. So that's another that's another very nice one, and I've heard um, good things anecdotally from my master gardeners. 
or that vanilla strawberry? Is that a sun or shade type? A vanilla strawberry, I would say go part sun. Um, because, you know, if you look at the size of those flowers, you want to make sure that you have enough sun to make that plant photosynthesize, produce sugars and carbs, and produce that flower. How about uh, the pollinators use the stems of hydrangea for overwintering, or do they use them for nesting or eggs? <clears throat> Um, I believe they do use them. I do frequently see hydrangeas in pollinator gardens. Um, so they do have kind of that, I think it's more of a hollow type stem on them, which is suitable. Now, I don't know which cultivars tend to be more pollinator friendly because some of the cultivars have sterile flowers. Some of them have kind of a mix between sterile and fertile. Uh, so that can get a little messy. Do, does anybody ever use large tomato cages to support hydrangeas? Yes, in fact, I did. I mean, that's I, I was using large tomato cases to support my Annabelle hydrangea, peony hoops. Yes, yes, those are some good options. This person has some overgrown mugo pines in front of their house, and they want to replace them with the Incredibles this season. Mm -hmm. When would you recommend as a time to plant, and do you recommend any soil amendments that are needed? I think you can plant this spring. Um, it is it is a perennial, and it should be quite hardy here. Um, so I think May would be a fine time to plant. Now, with with soil amendments, we do find that the hydrangeas don't like to have heavy clay soil. So if our listener has heavy clay soils, I would recommend um, incorporating some compost or peat moss. I think that helps quite a bit. Now, if you're on a sandy soil, same recommendations to help with uh, water retention. And with the Incredibles, you don't have to be playing around with the acidity or you don't have to add the salt, for, for example. Correct. Okay. Um, and same, there's a question about Annabelle. Do you have to play around with the aluminum sulfate or anything like that? No, you do not. And that's, that's a great bonus. Yep. Okay, what do you do about rabbit damage? They love her flowers. Rabbit damage, I would say apply a repellent. Now the repellent we have used here on campus for a lot of different plants is liquid fence. Liquid fence is made of um, putrescent egg solids and garlic, and the, the rabbits pretty much leave things alone. Does endless summer hydrangea stay blue in a pot if aluminum sulfate is added every year? The overwinter the plant in a pot as well in the garage. Now, if your garage um, is somewhat heated, I think that would help. Now, if your garage is going to get to 20 below zero, I'd be a little nervous about the whole container freezing. But if you've got a heated garage, which keeps it, you know, uh, fairly moderate. I think that would be a decent solution um, to, br to bring it in uh, in a container and the aluminum sulfate will help with uh, soil acidity. But you want to be careful. I've seen people burn the roots of these plants by over applying aluminum sulfate. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a matter of moderation too. Is mm -hmm. the aluminum and aluminum sulfate a concern or should this person be using like elemental sulfur instead in a pot? I would recommend sulfur over the aluminum sulfate. I mean, we're trying to get away from, you know, adding metals to the soil. And I, uh, so aluminum sulfate is not as sustainable as sulfur. Esther, how about uh, what zone of hardiness is that little lime or limelight? Uh, little lime and limelight should be zone three. Great. Um, what else we got here? Uh, You know, you mentioned for endless summer, mulching to 18 inches. Does that really mean like you put 18 inches of like shredded bark mulch underneath them? Is that what <laughs> no, no, I meant for overwintering. Oh, overwintering. Uh, for over, so mulching them, mulching them over the winter to try and protect those delicate flower buds. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. No, that was just that was just a confused viewer, namely me. How about uh, when you say cutting back a plant by one third? So let's say it's a six foot plant. Mm -hmm. Are we going to cut it down to four feet? Is that what you're talking about? Well, you can. You don't have to. If you, you like can. your plant, 
if you like your plant at that height, you don't have to go that drastically. But we find that a lot of our viewers are trying to make their plants a little bit more compact because it's outgrown the space. So if you want, you can just trim off the dead flowers on your paniculata and be okay. Or, or in general, like for a lot of like the, mm -hmm. the last group, mm -hmm. you said cut back to by one third. So mm -hmm. you just cut off the top one third to a light bud. Yes. Okay, I understand. Uh, can you use the cutback stems in a pollinator house? Like those hollow stems, maybe not. Huh? Uh, you, you certainly could. Uh, now, what I think is nice is if you can have stems of different sizes, because we do find that the pollinators are very picky. Some like little little stems, some like bigger stems and, and such. But I think you could. I think it would actually be a nice addition. How about uh, pr protect the uh, hydrangeas over winter? Can you use leaves as a mulch, or do you have other suggestions? I think leaves would be a fine mulch. Um, now, what I used to do is, you know, we had tree, we had more trees um, when I was in the tw living in the Twin Cities, and we would take, we'd rake up the leaves and just shred the leaves, and it made a really, really nice mulch. If the trunk of an old uh, can the trunk of an older limelight be cut to the ground? I I don't think so. I, I wouldn't go into the trunk. I, I I really couldn't guarantee that that would be uh, that would be a good thing. Uh, okay, for for that last group, you talked about like removing one third of the rejuvenations. Yes. So is, is that when you talk about cutting to the ground? Well, part of the well, cutting yeah. back, yeah, cutting back to you know the main the main um, stem, cutting back to the main stem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we just got a couple more minutes for questions. As we pause, maybe Bob doesn't have any music here. <laughs> We need the Jeopardy thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, double Jeopardy. Now for you, Esther, for $500. <laughs> um, Bob's paying. Uh, what suggestions do you have for homeowners whose hydrangeas just aren't doing well year after year? <sighs> I wonder why they're not doing well. Exactly. I mean, you may want to consider a soil test. You may want to consider consulting with your extension agent. You know, sometimes your, when your extension agent comes out, it may be just immediately obvious why something isn't working. You know, maybe it's getting too much sun or something. So right. we can try and describe uh, things over the phone, you know, but sometimes just having one look at a property situation can, can really reveal a lot. Yeah, and again, or like maybe it's too wet in the area. Mm -hmm. And like Esther says, you know, these are there's so many possibilities. So if your if your hydrangeas are struggling, you know, just contact your local county extension agent, or take some photos and, and contact them, give a better description of the situation, and then we can be more helpful to you. Okay, I think we're gonna shut it down there. Thank you, Esther. Well, you really did demystify hydrangeas. <laughs> I understand it a little bit more now. I really appreciate you simplified it very well. Thank, thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you, everybody. We're going to shut it down now for tonight. If you have a few more questions, you can type them in. Um, but we're going to shut it down. And next week, we're going to be talking about lawns and gardens. See you next week, everybody.